Michael Abels. Here I am. Here you are. Hello. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to fade out your music. <laughs> that was music that's warning you to get out and run away. So don't do that. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to get into your webinar. So I love it. I'm, I'm glad you're here. So everybody, Michael Abels has had his music played by major orchestras, and he's been a teacher and starting a film career in his 50s. He wrote music for two instant horror classics, Get Out and Us, and recently for the HBO film Bad Education, starring Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney. And it's no exaggeration to say that these three films could have been scored by three totally different composers. Get Out has that fantastic opening theme, which literally talks to the main character in Swahili, and some truly subtle and menacing heart music. And Us has ominous voices and gritty and lyrical strings. And Bad Education is almost Mendelssohnian in its traditional sound. And it's our great privilege to have Mike Labels here with us today. First off, where are you? I'm at home in LA in my studio. And when I called to schedule this interview, I was told you were working on not one, but two film projects in October. What are they and how are they going? Let's see. Uh, one was, I think, finished. One is called uh, Fake Famous. It's a documentary for HBO. It's about a journalist who decides to show that he can make anyone famous, anyone, he can turn anyone into an influencer by just buying them followers and scheduling them for photo shoots. So it's, it's, really, it's really fun. It's a very clever idea and uh, it'll probably be on HBO in February, I think. And then um, I'm working on a film called Beauty for Netflix. Okay. And I don't know that I can it's it's hard to describe. <laughs> I don't know that I can describe it. It's about a young singer, a uh, young African-American singer who is um, being courted by a record company back in about the mid eighties okay. and her family. And it shows, it's not about her, it's not about her singing. It's about, even though she's a singer and she's a, apparently a great singer, but it's not a, it's not a, um, a movie that wants to get by on letting you hear her sing. <laughs> okay. it the movie wants you to look at her family dynamics and what's going on in her life and how complicated um, it is to be a young rising star actually. So that's what the movie, it's actually a family drama and her, the fact that she's possibly on the verge of a breakout career is just a, a complication rather than what it's about. So, but did you have to write any song songs as opposed to underscoring for the film? No, sir. No, sir. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah. when the director and writer Jordan Peele contacted you about scoring Get Out a few years ago, you had never scored a film before. How surprised were you to get the call? Uh, very. <laughs> I, in fact, I thought I was being punked. Not by Jordan. Did, it was a, the post production supervisor who called, and uh, I automatically he left a message. It was very completely professional. I assumed I was being punked because in L.A., you know, the number of people who'll tell you they're a producer is, uh, you know, that's what everybody says they do. So uh, I had to have a friend look him up on IMDb, which is the database of people in the industry. And it turned out this producer had quite a list of credits. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I'm being punked, it's a very elaborate punk. They've set up this whole fake IMDB site for him. So I had the guy, at least to owe the guy a callback. Um, and he, uh, we talked, he said, have you heard of Jordan Peele? I said, yes. He said, believe it or not, he's written a, a, a horror movie script and we, he's directing for us. Would you, he says he would like you to consider doing the music. Can we send you a script? And I said, of course. <laughs> and so if you look if, in retrospect, I got sent what was to become the Oscar winning script for best screenplay. And that script was every bit as good on the page as it was in, in the, as it, on the film. And of course I wanted to meet Jordan and he turned out to be just as smart and funny as he uh, seems to be in all of his work. And I, am, I had been around enough to know that it's very rare that you get offered unbelievably unique projects and a chance to work with really smart and funny people on them. And so at the end of our lunch, I just said to him, look, I, I want you to be successful. And if you think I can participate in helping you be successful, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Fantastic. Now, my understanding is that 
appeals people found you through YouTube? Correct. So I have I'm have written concert orchestral music and some of those performances were on YouTube and they've had, you know, tens of hits like you'd expect. <laughs> Um, but one of the one of those several ten or several dozen people turned out to be Jordan, who was I think looking for someone who could handle the dissonant twentieth century orchestral language, you know, a la Penderecki or some of the other composers whose work has have have been used in horror film and suspense films, even though it wasn't originally written for that, um, but who also could understand the African American experience. So. I think he was essentially looking for me and I'm very glad he found me. Now, I understand that you had specific conversations about the blackness of the score. What yeah, were those yeah. yeah, I mean, in our first lunch, he said, uh, he said, I want the African-American voice, both metaphorically and literally in this score. And um, that's a pretty clear, um, pretty clear mandate. And we talked a lot about, we talked about what, what makes scary music and what is the what are the components of that and we can talk more about that but but we talked about the uh, regarding the voices we talked about how they needed to be the the voices of departed slaves and lynching victims and people who have been victims of uh, social injustice and how they they were trying to warn chris the lead character and warn him to to get out you know <laughs> uh, but but the thing about ghosts is they don't speak to us Ghosts don't speak to us in, in clear ways. They don't walk up to us and tell us what they want. They speak in metaphor and in shadows and in dreams and in images. So um, the question was, well, how, can, how would ghosts tell him to get out? And so, excuse me, I decided on Swahili because it wasn't really the slave's predominant language, but it's a very musical language. And I needed something that would sound African-y to people, but not that people, most people couldn't understand. And then I started writing phrases in that, uh, that would mean get out, <laughs> because get out's a turn of phrase. <laughs> that way, I mean, whatever that is in Swahili wouldn't have been right. So I think, what would, the, what would they say to, say to Chris? What would they try to say? And then I would translate those, those, um, translate those phrases into Swahili and then hear them and hear what, what sounds they, what music they suggested to me. And so out of my spreadsheet of, of, of um, phrases the, the ghost might say, I came up with the lyrics in Swahili for Sikiliza Kwabahenga. Nice. Now, in some ways, Get Out's a slippery film because it's horror one minute and comedy the next. Mm -hmm. Yet you managed to establish these very distinctive atmospheres with simple details. And like one thing I learned from the film is that harps can be deadly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that you you keep using this ambiguous heart music to set a scene of terror. Um, was that one of the things you talked about what makes music scary? What did you and Jordan Peele decide or agree makes music scary? Well, we we agreed that what makes it scary is the is the unfamiliar, first of all, just the you know, if there's a sound that uh, you don't know what it is, but also not just the un unfamiliar, but also the the non-mechanical. Um, Jordan was very much about what he called elemental sounds, and what he meant was sounds that are that are natural, that sound like they're being made by something in nature. Okay. Um, because if you hear a sound and you a you don't know what it is, but b you're sure that it's not a machine, <laughs> that's the sort of sound that you pay attention to. Like think about a tree knocking against the the roof of your house. You know, it makes a sound, and then but that sound is not repetitive. It's happening, but it, it, it there's no pattern. And that means that whatever it is, is probably alive. <laughs> and there's nothing like thinking that there's a living thing somewhere that you can't see and you don't know what it is, very disturbing. And so that, that's an example of a lot of sounds like that, that sound like they could be maybe, maybe alive, but you don't know what they are, that's upsetting. So that's one thing. But then also the, you know, a lot of attention in, in horror or suspense is about is about creating, allowing, giving your mind permission to take you where your dark place is. <laughs> you know, no one can scare you as much as you can scare yourself. So uh, a lot of suspense is about um, foreshadowing. And most of Get Out is really foreshadowing that something evil is happening, but you don't know what it is. And that the long, slow burn is just a killer. So 
the harp was used. Uh, the first cue I did when the film was assembled in rough cut, the first cue I tackled was the hypnotism scene because it's so crucial to the film. I knew it would be iconic because it's so brilliantly written and acted. And I just thought, you know, the this is so brilliant. The music has to, the music can't be the weak link. The music has to be just as good as what you see on the screen. So um, I thought the only way to sneak into this, this scene and be hypnotic is to use the harp. It's the most delicate sound I can think of. And so that's how I came up with that. And I knew that once I got music that Jordan liked for that scene, that then I would have a palette of sound from which I could draw the rest of the score. And so um, that's how that became a jumping off point. Now, is that how you've worked on subsequent films as well? That you find a scene that gives you, that anchors you in the sound world of the film and you work out? Or is it just whatever comes to you first? It's a, it's a combination of those two things. You have to, um, you know, certainly if an idea comes to you <laughs> and you're liking the idea, you should, you should do that because there's a point where you just have to jump in the pool and then figure out how to swim and figure out what you've jumped into, you know? So you jump into whatever you can, but obviously if you're gonna choose, you wanna choose something that you feel like you will get some work out that you will know if you're gonna have something work, you're gonna wanna build out from that. So you're gonna wanna choose something that is somehow relevant to everything else around it. Um, and, but also it depends on what the director, like Jordan likes to hear music while he's even in pre-production, he likes to design the sonic world while he's designing the visual world of a film. Other directors are not, they don't even, you know, there's, for every director, there's sort of a discovery of what film you're making as you're filming it. You kind of are in, as much as you plan, you're then when you see the film, you're a little bit informed by what the film is telling you it wants to be. Um, and, and so uh, sometimes, directors use that to, to help them make choices about music that they couldn't have made earlier on. So sometimes you're coming in after the film has been shot. And in fact, that's, that's, the more, often, that's more often the way that it's done. Right. Now, did you have any idea that your career would change so drastically as a result of this one film? No, I mean, I, my whole goal was simply to be able to finish the film and remain the, its composer because you know, composers are frequently fired um, because they, you know, they, music is a very personal thing. And sometimes you don't always, the director is just not feeling what you're doing and time is very short. And so if something's not working out, they often need to make sure they make a change while there's still time. Um, so I, my goal was really just to finish the film, have it open. <laughs> that, that was as, and because if, people who have scored a film would know how high a bar that is. That's a very worthy goal, you know, and there's no, uh, that's a, that's a real achievement. And I, uh, when the film opened number one at the box office, I was just, I couldn't even believe it. I couldn't even believe it. And then everything else that happened after that was just one more pinch me head turning all around, you know, moment after another. So. Yeah. I, had the experience of, I didn't know you'd written the music. And we worked together for about a week, 20 years ago. I don't know if you remember this, but it was in Atlanta with the Atlanta Symphony. Oh, well, when you when you bring up the situation, then yes. Yes, yeah. but other than that, I did not remember, no. And it was stone cold thrilling to see your name come up in the credits Gosh. at the beginning with that beautiful music too. Thank so you. I also love that after Get Out, it's been reported that Steven Spielberg called Peel and compared your relationship with Jordan Peele to his own relationship with John Williams. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> John, I mean, Jordan told me this story because Steven Spielberg called him. <laughs> and Jordan's someone who's been in the industry for many years, but to have directed your, what happened to him is that he had directed his first film. Never mind, you know, he, Key and Peele, he had done a lot of writing. And for all I know, some directing, I don't know whether he directed any of that, but you know, he had, it was certainly an experienced person in the business, but Get Out was still his first official film that he had directed. And to have Steven Spielberg call you and say, I saw your film and I loved it. I mean, what, it was just a huge compliment to him. And um, Spielberg apparently called to praise the film and actually like dissect scenes with Jordan and say, oh, and when this happened, when that, how did you come up with, you know, like really like, um, you know, wanting to share with him as a colleague. And it was a wonderful, 
an inspiring call for Jordan, but then he also d somehow mentioned me <laughs> and said that the music was good. And Steven Spielberg said the music was good. And he, he told Jordan, you should hang on to that guy. <laughs> he could, <laughs> you, you, should, you should, and so talk about a, talk about a professional uh, endorsement. I couldn't have asked for a better one. So thank you, Mr. Spielberg, very much. Thank you. So how closely did us follow Get Out? Um, two years, I guess. Us came out in 2019 and Get Out came out in 2017. So we were working on them both the years prior, 16 and 18. Okay. And they're similar in that they have young black protagonists in horrific situations, but they're very different films. Was your process different for us as well? In some ways. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, I mean, talk about expectations for Jordan being, you know, th through the roof. And I was just very, so impressed with how he handled that whole sophomore <laughs> situation. Um, the Get Out was done with a budget of under $5 million, I think. And, uh, and Us was a studio film, you know, a universal film. And so um, there were a lot more, um, a lot more eyes on the process, you know, and, and Jordan managed to handle all of that with just absolutely, um, with such a with such a cool hand and steady, uh, steady grip. Um, I had to. Um, I was meeting a lot of new people that I was working with because it was a studio film, so working with their people in their music department, and this is their first impression of me and everything. So they're, you know, wanting me to succeed, but also seeing that I'm doing things according to the way they expect. And uh, it was like having, it's like having a new job where you've had experience in that industry, but now it's a whole new team and you have to learn how all that works. And so um, there was a lot of that that was different. And also was um, um, us as a, the story of us is very complex in terms of everything that happens and all the different if, uh, as much as deep as Get Out is and all the metaphors and things that it talks about and takes on, whereas there's a clear message that Jordan was delivering with, with Get Out, he wanted the message with us to be a little m less clear. He wanted people, he wanted the audience to participate in the meaning of us. You know, it, part of it is left up to you to decide. And that that's a huge difference. And, and so the way that he, that, even though the story remained the same, the sequence of events in us changed a lot throughout the editing process. Like where do we cut from this story of this person being chased by her doppelganger to this person being chased by his doppelganger and how they react, you know, the, the sequence made a lot of difference in how the film played. So, um, so there was a lot of, um, times where we're like, oh, now we're doing this scene from a whole different perspective, you know? Um, and one of those actually was the pas de deux, which is the uh, where the uh, got five on it, uh, the horror version of got five on it happens. That scene was always in the film, but it was going to be a piece from the Nutcracker, which uh, is a pas de deux. And that, I was going to horrify that and make that very um, and really give that a dark turn. But um, but then when the trailer happened and it was so well received, Jordan knew that we had to deliver five on it in the film because he really, he's very in tune with the audience. He really wants audiences to, he, he looks at audience uh, feedback as being um, crucial to his process. It informs him about what's working. I think that's because of his improv comedy background. You know, he's not afraid of, of having the audience, per, you know, he wants to give the audience an experience. So, um, so he said, you know, we got to do five on it. That's got to be the pas de deux. So um, that was an example of just one more thing where we were going one way and then we suddenly went a different one in response to discovering what the film was that we were creating, so to speak. So those are some of the differences between the get out process and the us process. Now, at this point, were you worried at all about being typecast as a horror guy? I, I mean, I guess, but, you know, I, I've had worse problems. <laughs> I, I looked at all, I looked at ultimately all these, all these problems are first world problems that I get to experience. And so I'm not, uh, I have to look at all my, any problem I have in that light. But I also, you know, the Jordan's films are so uniquely their own genre 
I mean, I don't even consider Get Out to be a horror movie. I mean, I understand it was marketed that way, but I think of it really as like a thriller, like a, a Hitchcock thriller. Yes. Um, that's part of actually why I used the harp and strings because I wanted it to feel like it was an old fashioned, you know, like it might've been black and white, <laughs> like the way we think of Hitchcock films. And that was part of what was going on there. But um, I haven't been, I've been lucky. I, I haven't, I haven't, um, I mean, I may, I think I'm going to be doing other thrillers in the future. I look forward to that. Um, but I haven't mostly been asked to do um, in things necessarily in that genre. The things like Bad Education was this all classical score. Yeah. And, uh, I was thrilled to do that and just be able to do something entirely different. And the film is actually kind of a dark comedy. So, yeah, in fact, I was going to ask you about that film because it's, way less emotionally draining than Get Out. Yes, or especially Us, which is really draining. <laughs> and, the, and your score is very Hollywood academia. I mean, it's got echoes of Brahms and Mendelssohn, the kind of music you hear in a Hollywood film when you go on a campus, you know, a classic Hollywood film. Ah, great, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, was it a challenge to shift gears so dramatically between Get Out and Us and then coming to this project? Well, no, but that's kind of, that's kind of what I do. Like, that's a thing for me. Like every, I tell any young composer that you have to know what you're good at. You know, you, you may want to be an artist, but your want, that's like your ego. There's actually things you're good at <laughs> and they may not jive with what you, what it is you think you do, <laughs> but, but you do do things. You probably do them well. You need to learn what they are. One of the things I do well is I, um, have a, an eclectic harmonic language. Um, and so that's, for some people that could be a problem, but any, when you're an artist, any problem or bug could also be a feature. It's all about how you approach it and use it. So um, I just kind of, um, I just kind of think about the, the world that I'm supposed to be in and the way I would present myself. It's a little like, like a costume, you know, like a genre to me, a musical genre is like a costume. Um, whereas we think of like pop artists, you think of them, them as being identified with a genre and the idea of them changing genre would be like heresy or something <laughs> like, like it would be inauthentic. Like, you know, you would never have this one artist be in this other style. It would be not, they would be disowning their culture or something, but genre is a costume and you can dress for the occasion. And that's what I do with my music, I feel, as I, um, I'm in a certain world. The world of bad education is that of, is of higher education in a, a really like high stakes, high, high quality or high, you know, high attitude education. And we want to feel the, the hallowed halls. And, the, and so that's the music it needed. And so that's what I was trying to do. Well, we talked about your recent work, what you're up to now. Let's go all the way back to when you first fell in love with music. And I read a story somewhere that you actually, as a toddler, were terrified by In the Hall of the Mountain King. That's absolutely true. <laughs> I remember that I was, in a, I was in a crib. So I was like under two years old. My grandmother had a record of In the Hall of the Mountain King which if you think about it is actually a little horror movie before films were invented. It's a little tone poem about kids going, while going up into the fjord and meeting a, a giant and getting chased and running for their lives. And that music is terrifying. It is terrifying. And I screamed bloody murder. And my, my grandmother couldn't understand why I was crying. Um, but it was because the music is so horrifying. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I was not, a, I'm, I'm the kid who, you know, if there was ever a loud noise or something would go and hide in the other room. Like I, horror movies would give me horrible nightmares. I just was the last person who would ever choose to watch a film like that. Yeah. Um, but that's one of, and, and that music's one of my earliest musical memories for sure. So you mentioned your grandmother, you, you're the son of a black or Latino man and a white woman, but at yes. birth you were, you were adopted by your white grandparents. Correct and moved from Phoenix to, of all places, South Dakota. Yes. <laughs> I can't imagine there are a lot of black folks in South Dakota at that point in the 60s. I don't, I don't think I met one. <laughs> I remember meeting a black person who was visiting from somewhere else yeah. while I was on the farm. But, you know, the thing is you're, 
your, um, so I was under the age of six while I was living in South Dakota. And you have to think of your world as a young child. And what you know, what I was taught was that I was different and God, my grandparents told me I was different and special and God loved me very much. And I mean, you know, and every child should have parents so wise to just tell them that. And that was, and I was told I was, I was part black, but that did, I didn't have a context for that in that, in a world of all white people. And nobody, you know, as a precocious little kid and just eager to meet people and no, and nobody, um, you know, differences, friction in our society and things, those things happen when there are communities of people um, that are, have different cultures and those cultures are rubbing against each other. That's when you run into problems. Most people are very welcoming to one person of a different race or culture, especially if that person's a child. And so that was the experience I had in South Dakota. Um, and then when I, I actually went to school in Phoenix with my aunt and uncle raised me from, because um, I, I just, most of my schooling was actually back in Phoenix. And then I went to, to USC in Los Angeles. It was only when I got to college that I ever met a black community and was experiencing um, that side of my own background. And so I had to um, spend some time learning about that and figuring out, I was used to who I was in a mostly white community because that's how I had been raised. I had to figure out who I was in a mostly black community. And I actually spent time, um, I sang in a, at a black church where that was my way of using music to be a bridge to help me um, understand um, what was at that point a new culture to me, so. And at one point you didn't just sing at a black church, you were at essentially the black church with James Cleveland. Well, I, I recorded, an, a, I arranged an album for James Cleveland. Yeah, I didn't actually sing at his church. Oh, okay. Um, he, but he had a new, uh, he had a new choir. It wasn't his older choir, but a young choir. And it was all young people. And I, they were all about my age. And who was the, con I don't even remember who the connection was. Charles May. Charles May, who was a music director and singer and who sang on one of Quincy Jones' most successful albums, actually. Charles, I was a friend of Charles's through the church I was singing at, and he was the one who hooked me up with Reverend Cleveland. So anyway, wow, haven't thought of that <laughs> in decades, but yes. <laughs> yeah. And since you, since you brought up, um, since we've been talking about some specifically African-American music, can we talk a little bit about the Composers Diversity Collective? Yes. What so, that is and how it got started. Yeah, so uh, so after Get Out, I um, a couple things. I was um, contacted by a lot of young people of color saying, hey, I, you know, I saw Get Out and you did the music for it and um, you inspire me. And th that was amazing <laughs> and uh, very gratifying. And then also I would go to events in the, in the Hollywood community and I would meet other composers and other composers of color. And I would be like, hey, I know you, I see you, <laughs> you know, and we would say we should hang out like people do. And it was only after, and then after, a, a, after that, having that experience for a while, I realized, you know, if we said, if we picked a date and time and we said, let's all hang out, people would show up. And so um, we sent out an email only 10 days before the event. Um, and I thought if we had 10 people, it'd be great. So we had 50 people show up. Nice. And um, where I've met now, I know composers of every gender and uh, race and ethnic background more than I ever knew existed. And we are a great family and we're here to be visible to the entertainment community. And entertainment more than ever wants to be diverse. In general, there's a, a desire to be diverse and inclusive in the media industry, but people don't know people. And diversity takes, it's like a muscle you have to exercise. It doesn't happen naturally. People like to hang out with people they know and you know people who look like you and that people are just tribal. And I think that's kind of genetic even, but diversity is fun and actually can be great for your career, but you have to try. So Hollywood is trying. And so the Composers Diversity Collective says, hey, we're over here. If you're trying, we will fill up your contact list with lots of diverse names from every background. We write every style of music, both the ones from, from our own culture and outside our own culture. And, um, and we're at composersdiversitycollective.org. Nice. Well, I think it's a good time to open up for questions. 
Um, I know we wanted to promote a couple of people to panelists to ask their questions live. Let's see who we have. While we're doing that, I'll ask a question that's come up in the chat. Uh, Hello, Mr. Abels. Were you interested in composing creepy slash scary music before your time with Mr. Peel? Um, as someone who wasn't a big fan of horror movies, it wasn't uh, at the top of my list. But I did figure out that I did think that, you know, if you ever get a chance to score a film, it will probably be a horror film, I thought. Um, so I'd certainly, excuse me, I, I, you know, I, Obviously, I wouldn't be successful at it if I hadn't understood what really can affect people emotionally that way. I mean, I consider music, the music I write for film, I get, I have to watch actors do what they do hundreds of times as I'm scoring. And it always strikes me at just how good they are at portraying emotions and how it seems so authentic. And I know, and any actor will tell you is that there's a, they, there's a blend it's a it's a craft, but they 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 feel those emotions. A lot of them will say that it's you know they really have to feel the emotion to portray it. And so I I feel like well I'm not an actor, but music is my art, and so I want my music to feel just as visceral in the proper emotion as the actors who are maybe that's the sixteenth take, but what you see looks like authentic emotion happening to them. And so that's what my music is supposed to do. So. Um, so any sound that sets you on edge, if that's what we're looking for, or makes you uneasy, if that's what we're looking for, I'm very much, when I'm experimenting with sound, I'm comparing my, I'm checking in emotionally about how that sound makes me feel. And if it makes me feel uncomfortable, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> Thanks. We have a question from Marley Gilbert. If you can unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hi, Marley. Hi. <laughs> Um, how do you start deciding on instrumentation uh, for new projects? So uh, some of that is um, the genre of music that the director wants. What director wants a certain genre, that's going to tell you about certain instruments. Some of it is, is dictated by budget. There's always a budget constraint. And so some things are much more expensive than others. And you're going to have to, you know, Go with the things that are not going to break the budget. Um, after those things come the feelings that you need to portray. And some instruments, have, you know, make you feel a certain way, and that may be. Then there's also the basis of whether that's a stereotype that you want to work against, or whether it's something that you want to play into about an instrument. And so that happens. Uh, that factors in there as well. And I think it's mostly those three things. I don't. I don't get to, I don't get to, uh, for a film composer, very few decisions we make are made in a vacuum by ourselves, you know? So sometimes I'm, people give me credit for things that I would not have done if someone wasn't telling me I had to, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> this is what they want. <laughs> and they don't necessarily tell me how to solve the problem, but I'm definitely writing music that's designed to please someone else's idea of what's going to work. And so that's those that's how those decisions are made. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. We're looking for Corinna Washington. If you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Hello. Hey, Corinna. Um, I had a question about the anthem, which to this day still haunts me and keeps me up at night. Hey! <laughs> <Yay. laughs> um, so I wanted to know what influenced your choices for creating the anthem and like, did it have to do with the opening scene with the rabbits and all of that? And what language did you use for the lyrics there? And not, uh, to, inter not to interrupt, but Corinne is talking about the main title for us which yes. is called Anthem. Yes. Well, thank you for those questions. Those are great. So the scene, let's see, I several questions. So it wasn't based on the rabbits. That's, I knew, Jordan likes to do his credits old school, meaning there's, there's credits before the film, you know, and that's not done so much anymore, but it's a great opportunity for music. So, um, and I knew there was gonna be a main title and it had to be a piece that said, 
something bad's happening. <laughs> so there's people and they're, they're organizing and they're angry. <laughs> All right, so that's the feeling you're supposed to get from that piece, that there's people and they're organizing and they're not happy. Um, and so it was Jordan's idea. Jordan likes to ruin things for people. If you think about his films, there's lots of nice harmless things that he spoils. And I think, I think he gets off on that because he, it's not just music, you know, it's rabbits or it's, I asked him, I said, what is with the rabbits? And he just said, they scare me. <laughs> so I don't, I don't even, I don't even question Jordan a lot of times because, you know, like you just have to, you just have to go to acceptance of whatever he wants or says. So he said, let's use children's voices. That'll be creepy. <laughs> so I, I said, great, we'll use children's voices It'll, and we'll, they'll be creepy. So that was one consideration that he wanted. Another was that it needed to be multicultural. It needed to not sound like it was all of one culture. And so here was the interesting dilemma is that, you know, when people are organizing, there's nothing like a march that says that people are coming together with evil intent, right? So I knew it had to be a march in some way, but then marches are tend to be favored by cultures in the Northern hemisphere to put it obliquely, <laughs> like <laughs> Southern Hemisphere people are not so much about marching in their music. They don't, they don't get off on that. So how do you do a march that's not gonna sound like it's just all white people? And I thought, well, two things. One, I'm gonna slow it way down. It's gonna be very slow and there's gonna be pauses in between each of the words because part of what Jordan also loves is he loves silence in music. And so uh, since him telling me that back before Get Out, I've really kind of taken that on as part of my own musical language and I thought, it's gonna be very slow and that's gonna be creepy. And then I thought the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a really funky beat in there. So instead of being the marching music that you're used to, it's gonna make you wanna go like this while it's marching. And the dichotomy of those things, both the celebration and the creepiness, well, that's a total Jordan Peele, right? Like that's the children's voices. Oh, they're sweet children, but they're really evil sounding. Well, the, the march that makes you wanna dance is very evil in its own way. So, um, so it was that combination that made me feel like, oh, this is going to be, you know, creepy and just the right. It's going to be multiculturally march evil. And then Jordan said the words should be nonsense because we don't want to say what they're saying. So I thought, oh, great, I'll just write them later. And then at the end, I'm writing the lyrics and I realized, you know, there's no such thing as nonsense because everything that comes out of a person's mouth means something. Or we try to make it mean something, you know, even if we can't tell the meaning. And then it got a lot harder and I suddenly got a lot of respect for Dr. Seuss. <laughs> um, because, you know, I mean, I already, I have lots of respect for Dr. Seuss, but a new way in which I had um, respect for him. So to me, it's kind of like a little, like, like if Do like Dr. Seuss's tethered evil twin <laughs> in that it sounds like it's saying something and there's a rhyme scheme to the words, which make you notice the shape of the phrases, but it doesn't mean anything, so. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sure. You. Davaron Edwards, you're up. I need to unmute yourself. Classic Zoom. <laughs> Hello, how are you today? I enjoy, I enjoy your music. I right. wanted to ask you about um, the conducting. Do you conduct the music yourself when you use a, uh, an orchestra? And if you do not conduct yourself, uh, how closely do you uh, work with the conductor? Great question. So I can conduct, but you know, conduct, strangely, like my oldest friend in life who I've now known more than 50 years because we were in second grade together, he is a professional conductor. <laughs> and he, and I have seen, and I know what an incredible art conducting is and all the time he spent throughout his entire life becoming a conductor. And I have not spent any of that time. I've spent 1%, 1% 1 of what he spent. So I don't feel worthy really. <laughs> but I, I, to be honest, I've seen a lot of unworthy people conduct. <laughs> and so I just have to remember where well, there's lots of people who shouldn't be conducting who are conducting. But still, I consider it, I, I am, if I would rather hire a conductor because it allows me to be in the, in the studio and it allows me to be in the producer's chair and hear how it's sounding going down in the, in, the, in the booth. And I feel like my ears are sharper in that situation than from the stand where I'm, more, I'm worried about my conducting and am I doing it right? And that's where my head is 
when I should be in what is the orchestra doing, you know? So I, I have other people conduct when I can or when it makes sense. And I don't work with them a lot. Uh, I don't like work with them beforehand unless they ask me questions of the scores and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But, um, but because I have conducted, there's a lot of ways you can write a score that makes it easy or not easy to conduct. And anytime I get to a transition, I'm hyper aware, I'm sitting there and I'm like, how would I conduct this? And if it's, if it's complicated, I'm like, okay, that's, then we won't do it that way. <laughs> like, don't do it that way, do it the way that it's easy to conduct. And so I feel like I work with the conductor by solving problems they'd ask me before we even get to that point. That's one way. Um, then, then, uh, then sometimes a conductor, I work with the conductor, like in a recording session, a conductor may ask questions. And there are some questions that you answer only to the conductor in their ear. And then the conductor tells the orchestra, or there's some that you, you talk to the orchestra directly and you tell them all at the same time. And what those things are kind of depends on how you, you know, the dynamic between the orchestra and the conductor and the composer is an interesting one. And you only learn it through having the experience and having relation, you know, having the relationship. So you sometimes, it's hard for me to give you an example what the differences would be, but usually if it's a musical thing, I tell the conductor to tell the orchestra. But then if it's like, a, let's start from, bar 35 I'll tell everybody maybe does that I hope that answers your question it does thank you sure thanks now we have a question from a professor here at UGA Tom Heil who's a film who's a film composer himself and a professor oh. of commercial music hey Tom hey how are you so well. happy that you could be here thank uh you. yeah we just watched your film in class and discussed your score at length. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, how do you think uh, your musical education has gotten you to this point? Oh, uh, let's see. In, in every way, in every way. I mean, even in ways in which maybe what I learned in class was, okay, I hate this, whatever it is I'm being presented. <laughs> I hate this, it has no value. I feel like my time is wasted. When I felt that in school. I was like, okay, well this, today I learned what I'm not going to do. <laughs> right. And, and, and the, all the students are muted, so we don't hear them laughing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let me exactly. like, if you have, comp if there are composition students here, it's like, if I ask people, what kind of music do you like? Well, you get this, the lamest answers. You'd be like, well, I like all kinds of music, I like this, that. Then ask people what kind of music they hate. Oh my God, their eyes will <laughs> And they will seize you and they will tell you about all the terrible music they know. And so a lot of times I tell young composers, okay, write down everything you hate about this artist or this genre of music. Be really specific. You'll get a treatise. And I'll say, great, now flip that and that's what you're gonna do, you know? So even if you don't like some of your schooling or think it's a total waste of time, you're learning what not to do. And honestly, when in a world where you could do anything, learning what not to do is equally valuable. So Anytime that you are in a class and you wish that you were elsewhere, think about uh, this is someone is helping me rule out something, you know, like I would do it in music history. I was a terrible music history because I would say to the teacher, you know, this music is boring or this composer's work. Uh, why are we devoting like two weeks to, you know, Berlioz? <laughs> He's not worth two weeks. Like, music doesn't work. And I get that it's an important transition between music that works. But it's a transition. Well, mm -hmm. I would say things like that at age 18 and be a jerk. But it was how I felt. Now, I, but in me articulating that, it, it, I was teaching myself as a composer, what works, you know, and that part was crucial. So, um, and I just want to say also, just recently I was in a car and a piece of Berlioz I'd never heard was playing. And it was completely captivating. And I thought, here I've had this, <laughs> this bias <laughs> for like <laughs> decades. It's unfounded. I just didn't hear the right piece. So anyway. That's wonderful. Thank you, sir. We have a question from Kenya Garcia. If you could unmute yourself and. Oh, hi. How are you? Um, I'm a, I'm a intended uh, music composition major. And I wanted to ask you, um, have you like composed music for 
films outside of the U.S. And if you have um, composed music for like any like Mexican directors, because I'm Mexican, so I was like curious. Oh, well, let's see. So um, I haven't done any films for um, studios that are non-U.S. based, but mm -hmm. I but I feel like the 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 lines in the because especially because the way content is distributed i feel like those lines are not are very blurry and are getting more blurred all the time um i haven't worked for a mexican director but i um i know people who have and um also one great way to meet people in a particular you know, everybody's part of a tribe, whether that's your cultural heritage or your, or, or something, you, you've got a tribe of people. Your tribe is out making films and series and games. Your tribe is doing that somewhere. And one way that you can be successful is to find people in your tribe who need to hire composers and put yourself out there. Uh, um, at the Composers Diversity Collective, we reach out to um, film festivals. In LA, we have a um, Pan-African Film Festival, we have a Latin Latinx Film Festival, we have an uh, Asian Pacific Film Festival. And we've reached out to each of those to say, hey, we're composers of the, you know, and let, let us do a panel at your, at your film festival. And not only show that we're visible in, in your community, but to also this helps us meet directors and other people behind the camera in that um, niche of the industry who are looking for people. So. Um, I don't know if that's what you were implying in your question, but that's a thing that you should, as a, as a Latinx or Mexican, you should go and take advantage of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Allison McCoon asks, what advice do you have for someone who is trying to get into composing who has little, little prior experience with it? Gosh, um, that anything you can do that will give you some experience would be a good thing. You really can't lose in terms of that. There's no, it's ironic to me as the guy who was discovered on YouTube <laughs> at age 50 or even actually later than 50, when people ask me, how do I get into the industry? Because clearly I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> like I, you shouldn't ask me, <laughs> that's something I was not good at. Um, uh, but you, you need to have any experience you can get doing a project where you're writing music for other people is valuable. And it is not about the, um, people get hung up a lot in the, how they get paid about that and whether they're being fairly treated. And it's very emotionally frustrating. And I would just say, if you wanna be, if you want to feel like you're being ripped off or being mistreated, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for that, <laughs> but <laughs> but it happens to all of us, <laughs> and it's just par for the course. Like, you, like that's normal. That will happen. Instead, focus on the the experience and the opportunity that you get out of it, um, and just go for doing those things. And you will be able to say that you have done something, no matter how humble or small. You will have done that thing, and you have worked with people, and you will get out of it the experience of what it's like to communicate with people who aren't musicians and who very much are interested in music and have notes for you. And you have to figure out what it is they mean when they say it's not, it needs to be more mesmerizing. Like I just a couple of days ago got that note and I needed to figure out what that person meant and be able how to translate that into a new version of a cue that um, that, that person was gonna think was more mesmerizing. Interesting, Alyssa Soriano. If you could please put your camera on and unmute yourself. Mark, Al Alyssa is our teaching assistant. Uh, oh, I'm not sorry. Sure we have, I'm not sure we have somebody on video, but we have plenty of questions in the Q&A if you'd like to read another one. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just had a brain thing. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is an interesting question. For Allison Sandiford, hello, and thank you for being here. Us has a ton of creative visuals that foreshadow the doppelgangers. Are any of those visuals reflected by the soundtrack? Oh, 
Wow. Well, maybe the, the short answer is not specifically, but the long answer is, so Jordan said, as he was designing us, he said, so obviously it's about duality. So give me some instruments that don't belong together, he said. And that was his only note really. And then I went off and I just did some demos and I put instruments together that don't belong together. And it was really just about kind of like, it was like I took my sound libraries and just knocked over all everything and then picked up a couple of things again. Hmm, what could I do with these two, you know? And, um, and I didn't even have specific scenes in mind because he likes to very much kind of DJ the score. He likes to, you know, put things where they interest him, if they interest him. And especially because he's the writer, uh, you know, if, if the music works in the film, he'll be the first person to know where. Uh, so um, I sent him these demos and some of them, and some he didn't use, and since some ended up in the film or some ended up in the rough cut and then I, I adapted them into the film. So, um, so none of them go like, it's not like this instrument represents this character and this instrument represents their doppelganger. There's nothing that direct, but there's like, for example, in the beach, in the beach walk where the family walks across the beach as they're getting ready to have their, their this is early in the film and they're on the beach in Santa Cruz. And there's a shot from above where they walk and you see their shadows. And it's supposed to be a happy day at the beach, but it's the creepy music that tells you something's not right. And in that music, there's a, what is there? There's like a, there's a kalimba and there's a didgeridoo and there's a berimbau, which are instruments from three different continents. And then there's strings. I mean, like it's deliberately a like one from every continent sort of thing. That, that was a game I was playing with myself deliberately. It's like, well, I'll take one from every continent. And the, so there's something about that vibe of that unsettling vibe of the music that Jordan loved for that scene. So that music is there and it, it really just, it doesn't, it doesn't foreshadow doppelgangers specifically, but it foreshadows that something's not right. And it foreshadows this idea of duality and things that don't belong together being brought together by forces. So Kaylee Kim asks, um, there's a couple of questions here. What do you think about composers who juggle different positions such as conducting, playing an instrument, other kinds of writing other than music to go along with musical projects? You talked about how there is a distinction between what you're good at and following your ego. Do you have any advice for a college music student who is turning into a generalist? Wow, what a great question. Well, I, it's, it, this wasn't a, a judgment against people who are great at a lot of things. If <laughs> I have nothing but respect for that. I mean, if you, you know, if you should, if you are the best choice to conduct your scores, you should conduct them. You know, I had the pleasure of watching Jerry Goldsmith record a score back in the day. Um, no one would have told Jerry Goldsmith to get off the podium. <laughs> let me tell you, um, uh, you know, other composers are, you know, are instrumentalists and they're really great instrumentalists and they, play and I only play on my scores through the help of judicious editing and cleaning up of velocities and <laughs> and um, timing and everything. But if you could, if I could just play a cue live and have that work for the score, I would totally do it. So um, don't, don't limit your, don't limit your talents if you feel like you're interested in things and you're successful at them. Uh, go with all those things. Nice. And just a couple more questions as we're, as we're wrapping up. Fred Williams asks, I know the answer to this is not Berlioz. Who influenced your style? Who were your musical models? And do you have some favorite conductors? Huh. Yes. Well, actually, I'm deeply getting into Berlioz these days. No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, you know, I the, the who's your favorite composer question is one that I don't. I, it's hard because any piece that really works in any genre you know, grabs me. I mean, um, I can I can cite orchestral music because I'm so, you know, because I had an education in that, but oh my gosh, all of the popular music that I've ever heard has influenced me. I mean, those Quincy Jones productions of Michael Jackson, but also his own, his own albums. I mean, I used to take those and record them and slow the tape down so I could hear all of the instruments that were in the background because the production is so magnificent. I just, I would, I would almost weep. <laughs> I mean, like you would weep in great orchestra music, I'd weep at hearing the magnificent production of those dance records. I just couldn't believe it because it did everything it needed to do to just captivate you. 
and it happened all in the background of Michael Jackson. And and to me, it was to me it was Quincy Jones. All of that music. Um, I, sometimes there's a composer who just writes one piece of music, but that one is so perfect that they're they're forever in your mind. You know. Um, I I um, so one thing is like songs that have a particular chord progression that no other song has those live in my like Stevie Wonder has a bunch of those where just chords that only Stevie would have put together and then that that chord progression is instantly known to me as that song because of it goes from it doesn't go to the one to five it goes one to like three of six or something and then you're just forever in a like how did he do that um and things I have to me it's mostly that it's not like this one composer is great and I'm gonna learn everything about them. It's like these certain musical moments stand out for me. And then each one of those is something that I, every time I come back to it, I marvel at. And I, I hate that I'm saying this, but this is our final question from Andres Luz. Hi, Mr. Abels, I'm a big fan of your pas de deux from Us. What were your main influences and approach in coming up with all the grit and intensity in that track? It's awesome. Oh, thanks. So Jordan telling me we got to make the horror version of God Five on it. That's what that was. And then it's 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 that there's this you know what Jordan said from the beginning about duality. There's a duet. Then that song is da dum dum bum 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 bum. There's a call and response. So it's very easy to just play that up, and then add pauses in between when you hear them to build the tension because you know it's coming but you don't know when. Um, and then it's the ambience. It's the ambience of awesome you know, things that are shifting in pitch and are out of tune a little. And, and it, it, a lot of that track is achieved with the giant ambience of the, the really horrific parts. So um, that's, and, and changing the harmony to make it put your, you know, make the hair in the back of your neck stand up. Cool. Well, thank you. I have to say from all of us, at the University of Georgia. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I know you're an extremely busy man right now. And uh, this, was, this was fantastic. So. Mark, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it completely. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You have a great rest of your day. All right, you too. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye-bye. And for those of you who are still here, there's a question about uh, Michael Abels' website, so I'm going to drop them in the chat. Here's the website for the Composer Diversity Collective. It's composerdiversitycollective.org. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Next week is open mic for students. We'll see you then.